Okay, well, um, obviously the title of the, of the meeting um, suggests the importance of historical comparison. So I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the importance and validity of doing that, and doing that specifically in the case of revolutions, because it's by no means necessarily widely accepted that that's an important thing to do, or even a possible thing to do. Um, if you think about the kind of um, widespread, uh, common sense view of revolutions, I would say that it runs something like this, that before they happen, uh, they're impossible. When they happen, uh, they're inevitable. And after they've happened, they're unrepeatable, or at least it's undesirable that they should be repeated. And this um, kind of attitude uh, towards revolution, I would say, is widespread right across the society in a more or less sophisticated form from the popular press to academia. Obviously, more sophisticated in the popular press and less so <coughs> in academia. But um, what all these attitudes, whatever phase, before, during, after you take, um, all those attitudes um, presume that historical comparison is unnecessary because if it's inevitable or undesirable or uh, impossible then what would be the point of making a historical comparison but in actual fact in co historical comparison is absolutely vital because it's neither the case that history simply repeats itself if history simply repeated itself all you would need is memory you could remember what happened last time and it's going to happen again, so all you need to do is to recall what happened last time round. It would be um, history as Groundhog Day. And that obviously isn't true. But neither, at the other end of the spectrum, is it true that everything happens de novo, that each day we wake up and we've no idea whether the sun will continue to in its orbit, whether the uh, light of day will dawn and set in the evening, that everything that happens is going to happen anew. Obviously, what actually happens in any historical uh, process, and what particularly happens in revolutions, is that there's a combination of repetition and novelty. History does repeat itself, but it never repeats itself exactly or precisely. There are patterns in history, but they're not patterns which reproduce uh, in all their detail, and sometimes in important ways, they are very, very uh, different from what's gone uh, before. But nevertheless, the business of historical comparison of the revolution then and the revolution now is absolutely vital if you're to make both any sense of recent historical events, but particularly, and this is important if you come from the same kind of tradition that I do on the left and a Marxist tradition, particularly if you want to be not simply as uh, someone who describes the historical process or analyzes the historical process, but to play a role in how your society is developing. Then the business of comparison and analysis is linked to the question of agency, of being able to play a role in transforming society, in shaping its development one way or another. Now, let me make a couple of points, first of all, about the revolution that I've studied most recently, the English Revolution. Now, you would think, would you not, this is a very long time ago, uh, three and a half centuries and more uh, and more ago. Um, but the point I would like to make about it really is this, that sometimes when you are making these kind of comparisons, it's not always the largest facts of social and economic development which bear the closest comparison or shed the most direct light on contemporary events. Now, when I was studying the English Revolution, um, and the book that came out of it focuses on the radical organisation of the 1640s, the Levellers. And one of the interesting things about looking at that group of radicals 
is that the kind of narrow business of political organisation, rather than some of the larger context of the revolution, proved to be some of the most directly comparable to some of our experiences, uh, experiences uh, today. Marx and Engels thought that the Levellers were the first Communist Party, as they put it. And that's a reasonable thing to say, so long as you understand that Marx and Engels weren't using the term party in the sense of a modern political party, that they had more uh, in mind what we might describe as a movement. But however we define it, we were looking at an organised group of activists who were um, advanced in their ideas and persistent in their form of organisation. Indeed, you could make the point that the Levellers were the first democratic political organisation to invent some forms of political organisation and political protest which are still enormously common uh, today. So they were very effective users of the political petition and the political pamphlet. From underground presses, hidden away in the back streets and cellars of the City of London, they produced newspapers, pamphlets and petitions, not simply to inform, but to mobilise. So you can see in the uh, Thomason tracks, the great collection by the bookseller George Thomason of some 20,000 um, Civil War pamphlets, you will find productions of leveller pamphlets and petitions which say, not only give an argument or raise a political issue, but at the bottom of them they say, to be presented at Westminster this next Monday at 12 o'clock. In other words, they were in the business of political mobilisation. They would collect signatures to petitions at Sunday service. There would be landlords at pubs in the City of London who would collect in the petitions, collate them together and give them to the demonstrators to be presented all at once uh, down at Westminster. They were masters of the art of political mobilisation. Crowds of young London apprentices from the City of London could be brought down to Westminster while a demonstration was in place. And these demonstrations were so effective that uh, in 1642 they drove the King, they drove King Charles from his seat of government, from the capital city of the kingdom, and he never returned until he was beheaded in, 16, uh, in 1649. And if you think about it, political petitioning, if you think about the internet version of it, it's made a remarkable recovery as a political form of activity in the 21st century. The levellers would certainly have understood both the fact that Number 10 Downing Street has its own petition website and the convention that if you get over 100,000 signatures, this um, is then considered uh, for a debate on the floor of the House of Commons. And they would also have understood that it's not a requirement and that the MPs can ignore it if they wish. And that business of pamphleteering and petitioning, of then creating a political organisation around it, we have a marvellous account of the, the leader of the levellers, John Lilburn, speaking at uh, a meeting uh, down on the river at Wapping and appealing to the crowd um, for contributions, for print runs of petitions that were running into 30,000 petitions. That's huge. In, a, in London, which had 350,000 inhabitants, in a country that only had 5 million uh, inhabitants at that time, 30,000 petitions was absolutely huge. Um, an organisation that set up a political structure with subs, uh, graduated subs payment, depending on how uh, wealthy the members of the Levellers movement were. So there, you see a historical comparison which has some very direct and immediate parallels with things that are still done in political uh, movements to this day. 
Some of the bigger things, of course, and this is the other thing about historical comparison, we can learn as much from contrast as we can from direct association. So, of course, some of the, the bigger social economic questions about the comparison between the English Revolution and later revolutions, the Russian or the German Revolution or the Spanish Revolution, we learn much more from contrast. The Levellers were a political movement based on the apprentices, the small masters, the lesser gentry of English society in the 17th century. What they were not was a working class organisation because the working class in a modern form, certainly an industrialised working class, simply didn't exist in England in the, 17th, uh, in the 17th century. Some people, yes, a much smaller portion than uh, under a, a fully blown capitalist society worked for wages, but there was nothing uh, to compare with a modern uh, working, working class. So those things that we find in common are, if we look at the bigger comparison with the 17th century, transmuted from an organisation of uh, radicals uh, amongst the uh, bourgeoisie that was challenging for power against the Stuart uh, state, transmuted into forms of organisation of a class which hadn't yet come into existence in the 17th, uh, in the, in the 17th century. So any historical comparison depends on contrast as well as likeness, depends on difference as well as similarity. And only digging in to the historical detail of the period that you're studying or the periods that you're studying can reveal where the contrasts and the similarities lie. They're what show you what is similar about how a society goes into crisis, which arises um, from um, uh, polarisation and conflicts deep in the structure of society and the way in which that gives opportunities to political activists to change and transform the way in which the society, the society works. I guess, and I'll conclude with this, um, I guess one way to look at this, one way to look at how the experience of being the levellers or the experience of the Paris Commune, or of the Russian Revolution, or of the German Revolution, or of the Spanish uh, Revolution. And I know that Staff is going to talk about um, the Arab uh, Revolution's a huge wave, which, by the way, I think one thing that we should say about that is that um, it's one of the great examples of how it doesn't do uh, to write off the prospect of, uh, of revolution. If you think, um, irrespective of their fate, they were a multinational wave of uh, huge uh, revolutionary uh, mobilisation, just at a time when all the common sense of the society was that this couldn't happen again. And this is a repeated, this is a repeated experience. Uh, the French sociologist André Gortz um, predicted six months before May 68 that there would never be another general strike in Europe. The naysayers about the repeatability of revolution are quite frequently um, and, uh, and it seems to me persistently uh, proved, uh, proved wrong. But the thing I'd like to finish on, I guess, is about how to think about, um, about living in a period where revolutions are still possible and therefore why the historical experience of previous revolutions is um, a directly uh, relevant. And um, I'd like to put it like this, really. I'd like to put it in reference to um, the idea developed by the uh, great uh, 17th century uh, French philosopher, mathematician and inventor Blaise Pascal. And some of you may be familiar with the idea of Pascal's wager. But um, to put it simply, um, it was a wager about the existence of God, and Pascal's wager um, ran like this, that you might as well believe in the existence of God, even if you were um, not predisposed to by uh, theological uh, um, leanings, you might as well, because if God existed, then you were assured 
of a place in heaven. And if God didn't exist, you would still lead a virtuous life. And therefore, it was a bet on um, either of whom's outcome was beneficial uh, to the believer in God. Now, the great uh, French film director, Eric Romer, took this idea in a film called My Night with Maud and applied it uh, to the Marxist idea of revolution. He said, you might as well believe in revolution uh, because if you are proved to be right, you have played a role in bringing the revolution about and if you are proved to be wrong, you have still done the right thing in the great struggles of your day. Now, the only problem with this and with Pascal's original wager, of course, is that they are objectivist forms of thought. They say, let us analyze the situation, the existence or non-existence of God, the possibility or not of revolution, and make a kind of moral judgment or a moral commitment based on our analysis. But really, a properly Marxist understanding or reformulation of Pascal's wager won't be an objectivist and observatory gesture, because it will be a participatory gesture. This is the only bet where you can alter the likelihood of success while the game is in progress. The bet on revolution is not just an objective analysis of its likelihood, a comparison with previous experiences, it's a commitment to altering, to playing a part in, to shaping the struggles of your own day so that it becomes more possible rather than less, that reactionary outcomes are diminished and progressive possibilities are opened up. And it seems to me if we have that view, then the wager on uh, revolution and the experience of previous revolutions can be brought to bear on struggles today. Thank you, John. Status. So, right. Um, I'll do something that is uh, a bit cheeky, actually, for me, and about which I don't feel particularly confident, and I will explain you why. I'll say a few things, a few reflections about um, the Tunisian Revolution, despite the fact that I've never visited Tunisia in my, in my life, uh, despite the fact that I'm not a specialist of uh, Tunisia. But I have some, let's say, reasons, some more perhaps personal, some other that uh, can be argumented uh, a bit more explicitly. Um, <clears throat> the, the first reason is that um, the Tunisian revolution is uh, or has been the starting point, as we all know, of a broader cycle of the popular upheavals, which is usually called the Arab Spring, and which uh, spilled over the other side of the Mediterranean. There were obvious similarities in the forms of popular action between what happened in Spain and Greece with the occupation of the places. And since I was in Greece most of the time during the <coughs> occupation of Syntagma Square, I can very vividly remember the Tunisian flags that were waved by uh, the participants of those occupations and the fact that uh, what happened at the other side of the Mediterranean acted as a source of direct inspiration for what uh, the people in Spain or Greece were doing uh, at the time. <coughs> of course, this means that we also have to reflect on the differences of the outcomes of those movements in those specific circumstances and why uh, let's say, the, the way uh, the popular movement confronted uh, a dictatorship in the case of Tunisia and in the other Arab countries uh, was also different from what uh, happened in Spain and, and Greece by uh, other types of political processes. The second reason is um, that the Tunisian uh, revolution has been the only, perhaps limited in some regards, but significant success story of 
any <coughs> revolution I'm aware of since probably the Nicaraguan uh, revolution in 1980. What I mean by this are, are two things. Minimally, we can say that uh, at the very least, unlike Egypt or uh, in a way Syria, uh, the Tunisian revolution didn't end in a tragedy and in sheer counter-revolution. But uh, more importantly even, uh, the Tunisian revolution succeeded in stabilizing limited but very important gains. Uh, let me mention a few. A constitution, which is by far the most democratic uh, constitution of, uh, the, in the broader area. Uh, the existence of uh, important democratic rights, collective and individuals. And that played a very important role in the fact that despite the ups and downs and the numerous setbacks suffered by the most radical wings of the revolutionary movement, uh, in Tunisia we still find a politicized atmosphere, uh, the existence of popular movements, and now the anniversary, actually, what is considered in Tunisia as the anniversary of the revolution, the 14th of January, the day when Ben Ali had to leave uh, the country was in a way met by a new cycle of popular protest, which is still going on and which will play a very decisive role in the evolution to, to come. Um, these uh, uh, popular protests were sparked by uh, a set of economic measures decided by the current Tunisian government, uh, austerity measures, so they are anti-austerity protests. Uh, the immediate reason was the new budget that was voted in December by the Tunisian parliament with uh, very significant tax raises, including for uh, goods that are uh, essential for uh, the popular household. And of course, this indicates the fact that the social demands that were a crucial pack, uh, factor in uh, triggering uh, the revolution seven years ago are still with us and have not been satisfied. Now, let me go more precisely into my topic by emphasizing two variables that uh, we need to keep in mind when talking about Tunisia, because they turned out uh, having some level of structural permanence. The first is about the Tunisian state. Uh, the Tunisian state, as <coughs> Uh, many or most newly independent states of the post-colonial era is an authoritarian, very centralized state machine, strongly intervening in the allocation of material resources, which means that the economic mechanism in Tunisia is very politicized, and this should be seen from both from above and from below. From above, it means that uh, the business elite of uh, the country is continually uh, connected to uh, the state. In a way, all those capitalisms are forms of state capitalism. And what the neoliberal turn did in those areas is to allow uh, a level of direct privatization of the state with uh, the state actors becoming themselves, in a way, uh, beneficiaries of uh, economic resources. Uh, to put it more uh, simply, a form of kleptocracy uh, combined uh, there with the, with the pre-existing uh, economic uh, structure, generating an unprecedented level of corruption, which is an absolutely crucial factor to which I will come back in a moment. But uh, this role of the state in the allocation of material resources is also enormously important if we see things from below, uh, because the, the state, usually in a very clientelist uh, way, distributes uh, various forms of benefit uh, to uh, the population and uses this, of course, to build a whole system of social control and discipline, which is essential and has been essential for the perpetuation of the one-party state that ruled uh, Tunisia for all that time since independence and up to the uh, revolution of 2011. This is crucial to understand because it means that the state is, becomes the addressee of the popular demands. Uh, there is a demand 
of a state intervention by uh, the popular movement that uh, shapes in a very decisive way the configuration of popular action and popular protest. Now, the second factor uh, I want to emphasize concerning Tunisia is uh, the specificity and the robustness of its civil society. Uh, there were many things to say here, but I will focus on one which seems to me of a particular importance for understanding uh, <clears throat> what happened in the revolution. This is the role of the trade union movement in Tunisia, which is uh, exceptional in, uh, that, uh, in the whole area. Uh, the UGTT, UGTT in French, Union Générale uh, du Travail Tunisien, so the General Union of uh, Workers of uh, Tunisia, is a historical protagonist of political and social events in Tunisia since the struggle of, for independence, huh? which took in Tunisia a different form, let's say, than in Algeria with uh, the war for um, national uh, liberation. Um, the, uh, of course, the, the trade unions in Tunisia have an ambiguous or ambivalent relation to the regime. Uh, we should make a sharp difference here between, on the one hand, uh, the top leadership, which uh, always uh, inclined towards and was forced, actually, in a very authoritarian framework to um, find uh, a compromise and, uh, with uh, the existing regime, and local and, reg and regional branches plus combative federations which uh, have always been at the forefront of all forms of political action, both on the social but also on the political terrain. So we should analyze the trade union movement in Tunisia both as a political actor and as a form of social movement unionism. As a political actor, the UGTT uh, <coughs> became, uh, during the period before the revolution, the refuge for uh, a wide range of activists of uh, the radical left. Uh, their organizations were, uh, suffered severe uh, repression, uh, but uh, the trade union movement provided them a space in which they could still uh, organize and set, uh, and set actions. And uh, the trade union movement in Tunisia proved also being a major uh, actor and innovator in terms of social movement and I will uh, I have to refer here to two important uh, events and because they, they will directly uh, come in in uh, the course of the revolution. The first is that in the 2000 years the, the UGTT initiated a new form of, of action of or campaign around caravans in solidarity with the Palestinian people. So from various places of Tunisia, uh, the trade union activists uh, initiated uh, those, <coughs> those caravans. They were touring, they were collecting, of course, resources and agitating uh, to support uh, the Palestinian people. And this in itself had an anti-governmental, anti-regime stance implicitly but clearly because, as is well known, the Tunisian regime, even under Bourguiba, but even more so with Ben Ali from 87 onwards, was particularly soft, to put it uh, gently, on, uh, on Israel. Secondly, uh, the trade union movement played uh, the central, the absolutely decisive role in the single event that can be considered as being the annunciator and uh, the preparation actually for the 2011 revolution, which was the Gafsa uprising. Uh, the Gafsa is uh, an area in the southeastern part of Tunisia, uh, and all the economic activity of the area has been traditionally organized around the phosphate mines there, which belong to the state, and the state, of course, with the new liberal turn, uh, is restructuring them, uh, uh, firing off uh, many, many workers. Um, so uh, what started as a strike became a full-scale uh, mobilization, uh, which uh, around, of course, the strikers and the workers, around the local <coughs> communities to, uh, to regroup, uh, and created even new forms of organizing that became protagonists of the popular action to follow, more particularly the association of unemployed degree holders, uh, which uh, is very central in uh, the social problems uh, that Tunisian society is facing. 
So um, uh, GAFSA, those mines are very close geographically. Uh, they are in the same area with the city of Sidi Bouzid, where the revolution started, properly speaking, and then uh, started to, to expand. So what we can say is that although the trade union movement didn't provide a kind of centralized leadership at a national level for uh, the revolution, uh, it certainly uh, <clears throat> played uh, a decisive role in initiating at a local and sectoral level various movements and uh, furthermore, giving the impulse for the unification of those movements at a national, sectoral, and then, uh, at, sorry, at a local, sectoral, and then at a national level. The, 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 the culminating moment of that process were the two general strikes of the 13th and 14th of January, which directly led to the departure of, of Ben Ali and uh, the toppling down of, uh, his, uh, of his regime. Uh, a more complex process to which I, I, I'm coming now. Now, let me talk about the revolution itself starting from, uh, from above. Huh? You know that in, uh, probably many of you have uh, uh, in mind, I can't remember, John, did you remind the Lenin's famous sentence that the revolution happens when those <coughs> on the top, on above the rulers, cannot rule as they they used to, and, and the ruled do not want to be ruled as uh, they use uh, as they used to before. So this means that a, a regime crisis is uh, the necessary, although not the sufficient, uh, condition for a revolution to happen. And indeed, what uh, the, the Tunisian case is a full confirmation of that. Uh, the regime crisis, because of the combination of two reasons. The first is that the material basis for uh, organizing consent was put into uh, question by the effect of the crisis of 2008, but also uh, by the fact that this crisis just accentuated the extremely inegalitarian uh, character of the <coughs> growth that came before the, the, the crisis. Uh, this inequality in Tunisia is, of course, an extreme case of social inequality, with uh, the majority of the population living in a state of permanent hardship, but it is also hugely polarized spatially between the coastal part of the country where all the wealth is concentrated and the inner Tunisia, which is precisely the areas where the revolution uh, started. But we should also consider another factor, which is mentioned by, by Lenin, and uh, Gramsci has developed it much more in his writings on the so-called organic crisis and uh, the moment of, uh, let's say, hegemonic disruption. And this is the crisis in the legitimacy of the existing state and of the existing regime. So a level of moral crisis, right? And, and this in Tunisia was <coughs> particularly uh, the case. Uh, and it has to be analyzed, I think, in, in, two, in two ways. Huh? The first is that <coughs> the situation I've been describing before, the combination of political authoritarianism and uh, social inequality generated by uh, the mode of capital accumulation, uh, meant that uh, this whole idea of modernization, which in terms, as the regime put it, and framed it since independence, and even more so under Ben Ali, the westernization of uh, Tunisia didn't mean anything or stopped meaning anything positive for the majority of the population, right? Because it wasn't associated with any improvement actually of uh, their material, of, of their concrete material life and position, or if you like, by an increasing gap between what they could legitimately expect, because you know, the expectations are raised in a way by the discourse themselves and the reality they were living in. The second is, of course, the issue of corruption, uh, which, as I said before, corruption here has to be uh, understood both as uh, the corruption of the top, of the, sum, of the summit, but also the whole mode of social control and discipline from below that was uh, an essential part of the one party, of the party state, actually, that uh, existed before. So the moral crisis is very, and has been very central in the crisis of legitimacy, and this entails two important consequences. The first is that uh, the demands of the popular masses were framed in moral terms. But by this I mean that even the material 
demands, which of course have the value in themselves, were immediately framed in something that went beyond those demands and that expressed a demand for living another type of life. Uh, for instance, the, the demand for bread uh, had a symbolic value which meant that we want a normal life, uh, not just food, if you like. Uh, but also, it explains the key word of uh, the masses, actually what mobilized them and energized them, which was the demand for dignity, right? National uh, dignity and, and a life of dignity uh, were really what the watchwords of the mass uh, demonstrations during the entire revolutionary process. So it's not just to get rid of some corrupt leaders, actually. It's to reshape, if you like, the social fabric uh, along a different type of moral code and a different type of cultural cement. And this is where Islam comes in. That's the, the, the second factor. Uh, I don't want, of course, to make a general point here about, you know, the, the Nahda party, which is the political expression of uh, political Islam in Tunisia, and which is the, the major party in the Tunisian political landscape after the revolution. But what I just want to say is that one of the essential sources of, of, of the strength that uh, Islam uh, gained and had in that whole process is the fact that it provided a moral code both to contest the legitimacy of the corruption and the regime and to articulate the demands for fairness and dignity of uh, the popular masses and that if we don't understand this we miss an absolutely crucial point in what gives to this and gave to this movement, uh, movement a particular a particular strength now how much time do i still have Five minutes, okay. So I'll be, very, I'll be very quick in what I wanted actually to develop a bit more, which are the forms of popular action in, um, in, in Tunisia. Um, let me put it this way. The decisive moment in the revolutionary process was not the toppling of Ben Ali himself as the leader. Ben Ali left the 14th of uh, January, but he appointed a successor uh, which was one of his, a person of his, close on, on, of his close entourage, and the scenario that was elaborated at the time by the political establishment in Tunisia and by all the big international players, starting from the US, of course, and uh, uh, France and other countries that consider that have a stake in Tunisia, was the fact that we will have a kind of controlled transition. Huh? And this is the scenario that has played out all the time in Latin America, I mean, everywhere where, you know, dictatorships have fallen, uh, the whole thing was to have, you know, to, to control uh, the process of transition and to avoid any break that would open a breach, actually, not just, you know, in the top layer of the regime, but much more deeply within the structures of the state and uh, the social structure. And this scenario failed in Tunisia because actually what happened after the departure of Ben Ali is more or has been more decisive than what came before. So what happened after is a new cycle of popular mobilizations, the so-called Casbah 1 and Casbah 2. So caravans starting from various parts of uh, the country and ending in uh, Tunis, in the capital, occupying a very symbolic central place, uh, the, the, the Casbah. And it's only then after the two Casbah movements that uh, the, the, the puppet government put in place by Ben Ali resigned, elections were called for November of 2011, and a constituent assembly uh, would be uh, the outcome of those, of those elections. So the breach, if you like, happens, happens there, and it is at that moment that the real strength of the political capacity and power of the popular movement was, was, test, was tested and passed the test uh, uh, successfully. I don't have time to develop a part which I had prepared on the forms of organization and leadership that uh, the Tunisian uh, revolution uh, actually uh, uh, provided. Uh, as you probably remember, uh, nearly all the international attention at that moment on the Tunisian um, events was focused around uh, the role of social media and the so-called leaderless uh, masses. Huh? Uh, 
concerning the role of the social me media, this has been clearly magnified, and I think that I have suggested already that the concrete repertoires of action that uh, played out, actually, and, and provided, you know, the real strength of the popular movement were either already uh, uh, somehow designed and practiced by concrete political actors, so the trade unions, but also uh, political activists of various political currents, and they combined with quite traditional uh, forms of popular action of a non-institutional uh, of a non-institutional form, uh, such as rioting, for instance, uh, which was particularly uh, popular among the uh, unemployed and socially marginalized uh, youth, which uh, uh, rioted in, you know, the local neighborhoods, whereas demonstrations, of course, uh, happened in uh, much more central places of, uh, of, of the cities. So you, we had a huge uh, repertoire of action combining the already existing with with the new or, 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 or the newish, uh, culminating with the occupation of the central squares in uh, the Casbah uh, 1 and 2. And it's only in that framework that sh we should analyze the role that technologies such as the social media uh, played. Now, telegraphically, three points to conclude. The first is, uh, which are about, you know, the strategies that, the kind of strategic lessons that we can take, I think, from, from this. The first is that the indicator of the strength of the popular movement, that if you like the real test of success for any kind of revolution, is its capacity to provide and stabilize institutionalized forms of gains and conquests for the broad popular masses. Even if those gains or conquests are, do not amount to a radical change of the social or the political structure. Even in a more limited way, this is absolutely crucial, and this goes against, I think, all those readings and interpretations that, uh, you know, re-emerged and saying that, you know, we should disregard the state, that the state is, you know, of no importance for us, that we should be spaces that are completely external and outside the state, and you see the masses, you know, do not care about uh, the states anymore. This is absolutely irrelevant, I think, in uh, the case of uh, Tunisia. The second thing is that the key of success of uh, the popular uh, movement, what gave them the, the, their imp impetus and energy is their capacity to build broad coalitions between several social factors, which also means that politically uh, lies in the capacity of bringing together and maintaining a form of uh, unity and coordination between very uh, heterogeneous, actually, political currents, right? Well, one, one of the big differences of Tunisia is the fact that uh, political Islam and NAFTA have been a constitutive part of uh, the political forces which joined the revolutionary movement, although they did not initiate it, and that uh, the, the level of, of uh, uh, let's say, political exchange, although with a lot of tension now, with the rest of the uh, progressive forces, um, was never totally <coughs> broken. And this has to do with the strength of civil society as I developed before. And the third uh, and, and last, you know, uh, think we should uh, retain from this is what has been, I have heard just a few days ago in the radio or in TV rather by one uh, of the leading figures, let's say, of the current cycle of popular uh, protest. Yes, uh, we did a revolution in 2011, but you know, revolutions are unfinished businesses. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stathis and John. So we have uh, plenty of time for uh, questions, uh, contributions. Um, yeah. We'll take them in rounds. And there's, um, there's mics going around as well. So just wait for the mic. Yeah, Pedro. Yeah. Thanks very much both. My question is a bit more for Stathis, <coughs> but if John wants to comment, please feel free to as well. Stathis, in your talk you highlighted a lot the importance of, yeah, okay. you highlighted a lot the importance of building bridges, forming big coalitions, institutionalizing, and so on and so forth. 
But you also pointed out uh, the big importance of extra-institutional action in bringing about the revolution and its continued vitality and resort to strikes and other forms of action afterwards, which stands a bit in tension with what you're saying about institutionalizing and bringing it into the state. I completely agree with your point about disregarding the whole change the world without taking power thing, but without resorting to extra institutional action, without having some element of difference of heterogeneity, one could argue that the movement and the revolution loses vitality. So if you could explore a bit how do you see the relationship between the trade union social movements and the post-revolutionary state in Tunisia? I think that, that would be a very interesting thing for us to comment upon. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just behind you. Yeah. Um, it's a question for all of you, if you want to answer it, but I was just wondering about um, your thoughts and opinions on the internet uh, and how it's affected social mobilization and whether or not you think the internet has had a positive or negative um, impact on the way that we today do activism and the way that we today do, we mobilize. Okay, um, we'll take, yeah, over there. I think it's, oh, I meant Jay, actually. Is that Jay? Yeah, thanks okay, very much, um, both of you, for very <laughs> interesting um, interventions. I, I just wanted to raise a question that I think is kind of, um, I feel is kind of missing from the discussion that is going on, uh, you know, politically around the left at the moment, certainly in Britain and maybe elsewhere, which is, um, actually Stathis did, did mention, which is the question of the state, because it seems to me that you know, we're in a paradoxical situation where there's a very big crisis, not just a political crisis, but a crisis of all the institutions, um, accompanied by a very strong radicalization. It's a polarization, but a radicalization to the left as well as uh, to the right, and a moment when um, the state is, you know, uh, there's a huge kind of controversy around the, the state under neoliberalism, but I think most people would agree the state is at least one thing that's happening to it is it's becoming more authoritarian. And yet we're in a situation where, you know, a lot of the left discussion seems to me to be about uh, transitioning by, you know, a fairly simple idea of getting elected, taking over the state, and then instituting um, progressive politics. So I just wanted to put it out there that, you know, I feel quite strongly that at the moment, the question of uh, the way that the state is structured, the interests the state serves, the extent to which it's possible to democratize it, the extent to which it needs to be dismantled in order for there to be change, is a very, very important question. I'd like to know what the, what, you know, it's a big question, but in briefly what the speakers think about it, but I think it's something that we need to get out there as, as a very important part of the discussion that needs to happen at the moment. Thanks. And then just Hi. Um, yes, actually, my, my question links maybe a little bit to, to what you said and was to Stathis um, and, and John as well. Um, in relation to, I was thinking in relation to the UK, the, the point that you made at the end, Stathis, that kind of heterogeneous groups working together and working from kind of outside of institutions and within. I was just thinking of even to the, the kind of limited extent to which this is happening and trying to happen now through momentum and groups kind of further on the left and you know working within the Labour Party and outside as well there is this um, completely unexpected but obviously very destructive um, media commentary about how it's the hard left trying to take over and, and that and I wondered what your advice would be as to how how this process can continue without it just becoming hijacked by that media and those interests so Thanks, and then over here. 
just two rows down. Yeah, yeah thank you for both of your talks. Uh, my question is directed at both of you. And Stathi, you said the test of the success really lies into what to what extent the movements can provide institutional gains for p the popular mobilizations. But in my reading, I've always thought that actually to what extent can the movement, popular movements create revolutionary organs or new sets of institutions, which uh, in the case of the Russian revolutions or the Soviets or in Iran, we saw similar occurrences of worker control or in the Venezuelan and Bolivarian experience with, with the Comunas. <coughs> And so the question is, is like, and this also hints towards John's, we talk about coordination, unity, coalition building, different forms of political mobilization. What form of, you know, uh, revolutionary institutions do we actually think are viable today? Will we see uh, Soviets in the way of, you know, workers' factories? I don't see any factories in London. How would those, how can that look like and what can we learn from the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Thanks. Okay. Do you want to um, address those and then we can take another one? Shall I, shall I start? Yeah. Yes. Thanks a lot for those questions. Huh? These are, I mean, these cover in a way uh, all the issues uh, that are usually go with um, any debate, I think, on, <coughs> let's say, revolutionary strategy or reflecting <coughs> on revolution. Let me start with, I will combine, I think, the, the first and, and the last about, uh, yes, there is a tension between the extra institutional and the institutional forms of action, right? But uh, I think that, you know, any, any anti-capitalist strategy has to include both and work out them concretely in specific uh, conjunctures and circumstances. First of all, as you understand, there is a big difference between realities such as Tunisia, where we had a dictatorship and a very authoritarian regime, and therefore a very narrow margin for institutional action, right? So gaining a space, opening up a space in those circumstances is in itself quite, quite important, right? Uh, we, we have more possibilities of institutional forms of action, let's say, in the UK or in <coughs> most European countries, uh, but, but once again, these need to be combined with what is exactly extra institutional action. I mean, you seem to suggest that, you know, strikes are, are extra institutional forms of action, which is certainly not the case. Huh? You know, I've been on strike many times as a UCU member, and, you know, the whole procedure, particularly in this country, is very <coughs> bureaucratized. Huh? So not only institutional, but, but extremely bureaucratized, and, and, of course, very much, you know, constrained. Uh, by this. So non-institutional forms of strike do exist, of course, the so-called wildcat strikes, but you know they are relatively low. They have been quite rare in, in, in the recent years. But in any case, what, what we can see concretely uh, is um, the fact that, you know, repertoires of action have in a kind of very pragmatic way to be considered as what is efficient in a given circumstances because this is how the popular movements themselves actually and the actors of those movements think about the situation, right? And, and uh, uh, we, we should think about, you know, enlarging actually the repertoire of those actions in a way that really makes sense. Huh? And, and to make sense, you need to get a result, you know, in collective action. I mean, otherwise, you know, the kind of heroic solos, etc., are, are of absolutely no interest, I mean, for, you know, the broader, let's say, layers of the population or the people we, uh, we would like, you know, to be, to be part of a process of, of a social change. Huh? That, that's one thing. The second thing is that institutional gains, look, I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking of concrete, I mean, I'm, I'm very Leninist in this, uh, concrete analysis of concrete situations, right? So the situation in Tunisia was revolutionary, but I tried to explain why the demands and the concrete issues that were at stake were not those of an anti-capitalist revolution, right? The, this was just n not w what was at stake at that moment. So if you see things from that perspective, the possibility or not of having democratic gains institutionalized in things such as constitutions, legal frameworks, etc., are absolutely crucial. I mean, the fact, let, let, let's see the things the other way around. When this doesn't happen, 
For instance, it didn't happen in many Latin, Latin American countries, starting from Chile. You know, Pinochet died still as a full general of the Chilean army. His constitution is still in place and blocks even minimal popular demands, such as free higher education. Huh? So the entire framework of the dictatorship is in place with only marginal or very limited uh, changes. And this, of course, is not only about the constitution. It is about you know, the deep state and the state structures, etc. But if you don't open a bridge in at, at that level, you, you haven't even started the job. The fact that, you know, if you make a comparison, once again, uh, between Greece, okay, my country, and, you know, the gains we had after the fall of the dictatorship, only, Port only Portugal, because they had a more radical process even than us, uh, went further with the Portuguese uh, constitution of, which was almost a socialist constitution, actually, in, in 1975. But the Greek constitution of 1975, same year, actually, was a very progressive constitution. This is why they want to change it now, you know, in order to impose a much more authoritarian and, and top-down form of, of governance, actually, in the country which would fit, you know, the Troika, the Troika rule. So it's absolutely, um, <clears throat> it's absolutely essential. Uh, on, the, on the internet, uh, I, I don't have time, you know, to discuss fully the issue. I'll, I'll just say two things here. The first is that uh, we can talk, I mean, for hours about what changes with the Internet and what are the new possibilities that this opens <coughs> up. Huh? And, and we, we should look, you know, concretely at what this means in terms of organizing. Many times younger people seem to think that, you know, before, before the Internet nothing existed. But, you know, I became... <laughs> I became a political activist at a moment where, you know, we only have phones, we were spending hours calling uh, people. Uh, when, when I was a high school student, my mom was constantly shouting because I was spending hours, you know, calling the comrades and, and so on. So, you know, we, we still had, you know, we, we still had tools actually to organize that, that were relatively decentralized, by the way. You know, the, the telephone, even before the mobiles, huh? You just took your phone and you could talk, you know, to people, okay? It was limited, okay? It was, it was a one-to-one -one conversation, but you didn't have to go through, you know, a kind of very a whole pyramid, actually, to, to do things. And so many things that now appear as super extra new, etc., were not that completely, you see, uh, uh, new and decentralized. And by the way, in Greece, because of, you know, the very long experience of uh, clandestine, of illegal work, actually, uh, activists of older generations than myself, but that were still, you know, very active in the organizations I was in, uh, were very trained in, act, in acting in a kind of very decentralized way and, and uh, you know, taking initiatives and all these kind of things. So that, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing, I mean, the Internet doesn't substitute for the need of uh, leadership and organization. We, we need to rethink important dimensions of that. That's absolutely certain. It opens up possibilities that didn't exist before, despite what I've just said. Uh, th this is for certain, but it, it, it doesn't dispense us from thinking about organization. It's not the ready-made solution to organization. It's just a lie to say to people, I have an electronic platform. We don't need somehow structures, organizations of one form or another. Then I'm fully aware of the fact that certain forms of organizing historically have failed, that, you know, people are totally hostile to them, they reject them, not only, not always for the good reasons, but there is certainly a core of truth, you know, a core of, of valid objections to them. Uh, all this is true, but, you know, this is still a problem that is with us. Huh? It's not something that belongs to the past. And finally, those, technolog those technologies generate themselves issues of power. I mean, it's a complete illusion to think that, you know, the Internet is just purely uh, horizontal. I mean, the people who control uh, a Facebook page, who control a website, uh, who have, you know, who have created a kind of influential blog or whatever, they play a very important role. They, they, so these new technological means do provide 
new forms, new types, if you like, of leaderships, sometimes informal, sometimes acting in denial of what they are doing. But I'm sorry, what they are doing are, you know, a way of leading, you know, of influencing things, of influencing actions, of organizing them, of, you know, pushing people, of taking initiatives. So they are performing functions that are of an organizational, actually, type and that create somehow new forms of collective uh, entities and, and, and connections on which we have to uh, think again. Now, the dismantling of the state is, of course, a recurrent uh, matter. Uh, f I, I'm not really sure to understand what the dismantling of the state is, because what we mean by overseeing the state, actually, for us now, is quite different from what it used to be when, you know, Marx or Lenin uh, formed their first formulations. Do we want to dismantle the NHS? don't think we want to dismantle the NHS, we want to change the NHS, we want to improve it, but I don't think we want to dismantle the NHS. As the NHS. Do we want to dismantle the repressive apparatuses of the state? Yes, we want to dismantle them. We want deeply somehow to um, uh, uh, dismantle those structures that are a permanent or can become uh, a permanent obstacle to, um, social, uh, to social change. Does this have to go uh, through a process of military armed uh, confrontation? Uh, it depends on the cases. We, we can't give a general answer to that. Uh, it might be the case that, uh, you know, uh, we know that the ruling class, when it feels threatened in its power as a class, uh, uh, can resort to, uh, can call from, <coughs> to, to violent action, uh, to violent counter-revolution. Chile is, of course, the perfect example uh, of that. But you see, my point, the, the, the reason I'm mentioning Chile here is very important, because in Chile, the decision to take violent action was not taken by the popular movement, was not taken by the Chilean workers. It was taken by the Chilean bourgeoisie with the support of US imperialism. They broke their own legality. They overthrew a legally elected government. And the mistake of that government was not to have fought via elections, but to have refused to uh, go beyond you know, the very, na very narrow conception of legality and prepare seriously for this type of confrontation, which it didn't do. Right? Instead of you know, preparing uh, for uh, a military coup, uh, they appointed generals and even Pinochet himself, actually, to, uh, to, the, to, to the cabinet. So I think that you know, the, this whole idea, of course, deep social change cannot go ahead without a very deep transformation of the state. And this means that you know, some parts of the state need to be taken control of, changed, reformed, uh, reshaped somehow, some other parts need to be uh, dismantled, but strategically this depends on, you know, what are the possibilities you have to get access to forms of political power in situations where the popular forces have the possibility uh, to access governmental power, which is not power to coup, huh? which is not uh, political power in general, well, they use it, and they are right to do so. And, 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 and historically, in all cases where this has been a concrete possibility, refusing it, rejecting it, has been a folly, you know, and, and, and a clear mistake uh, by those who thought that you can repeat, you know, the recipes of the past. Yes, I'm, I'm finishing with the last question, with the last point. Um, it, it was Mark, actually, and, and the dual power. You see, that, that's, my, that's my point. Why don't we have any serious, you, you see, um, once again, we have to learn from the ex concrete experiences of the masses, right? Uh, Lenin didn't decide, I mean, Soviets, he was completely surprised by the creation of Soviets in, in 1905, even, even more so than in 1917, but the Soviets or whatever are the creations of the masses. Why don't we have uh, for that type of dual power situation emerging since I don't know how many years, because the forms of the state have changed. Because the organization of consent and repression actually has changed. Both remain. No? But states are still very coercive apparatuses, but they don't act like the Tsarist uh, state. They, they don't, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a different type of, uh, of situation. It has to be dealt with differently. You mentioned the example of Venezuela. Venezuela is, is a very good example of how 
new organs can be created and have and, and, and they were created in order to enlarge popular participation, in order to install what they call the protagonist democracy, right? And this is very important, of course, without those organs allowing, you know, genuine forms of popular participation that go beyond the parliamentary uh, form, uh, you, you can't go ahead in the direction of social change. But this is not at all the same than the old form of dual power strategy, because it was put in place by an already existing, call it left-wing, progressive, socialist, whatever uh, type, of, uh, type of government that you know, was leading somehow things uh, in, in a certain type of, of, of direction. So we should you know, talk concretely about the present and, and absolutely, absolutely reject you know, this kind of mythologizing of the past and the idea that you know, the solution is somehow in repeating some kind of, of recipe but, of course, taking all the lessons of history, as John brilliantly uh, did in his uh, presentation. Yeah, I think with the question of institutions, you have to distinguish two things. One, um, if you like, um, in a pre-revolutionary period, working through whatever existing parliament, whatever existing uh, institutions there are, and I think that's always very important. You should always grasp every opportunity in uh, no matter how unrevolutionary a, a, a body as a platform to make uh, to make political arguments this is lenin's argument of, of course about using the czarist duma as a platform it's what actually in in egypt for the revolution the the muslim brotherhood made very effective use of the entirely puppet parliament that mubarak um set up and when they were excluded or um or denied um, access by, by force, they made very effective use of, of that fact as well. So there's, there's that question. I think actually the, the, the more important question though is um, the fact that in the course of the most uh, thoroughgoing and effective revolutions, um, what begins as a spontaneous movement creates new institutions. And that's the interesting, that's the really interesting question. You think, you think about it, uh, in the English Revolution, um, the Long Parliament um, transformed the existing constitution by making the Commons dominant and was used as a revolutionary lever um, by, the bourge, by the bourgeoisie. Um, as the Civil War developed, the new model army became an institution of popular power and popular mobilization in the French Revolution, the Jacobin clubs and the convention, in the Paris Commune, the Commune itself, in the Russian Revolution, the Soviets and in the German Revolution and so on and so on. So I, I think one of the limitations both in Tunisia and in Egypt was that although civil society, existing civil society organizations mobilized, um, they're never, and, and this was, it was almost it was almost hard to believe that it didn't in Egypt because you had the so-called uh, Republic of Tahir, um, the, the mass mobilization in Tahir Square. And it was, it was almost, I mean, I was in Tahir Square for nine out of the 18 days that brought down Mubarak. And it was almost unbelievable that at a certain point, some kind of democratic structure in which political positions could be argued out and precise forms of action uh, described and, and articulated and, and implemented didn't emerge from that experience. But it remained at a kind of incohate level and therefore um, could act defensively and effectively, for instance, on the day of the camels when the, the vigilantes tried to break it up, but couldn't develop a, 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 a kind of offensive, um, offensive program. So I think that's still a very much an absolutely critical question about how revolutions develop. Can they, in the course of their existence, uh, produce an institution which allows um, both inclusivity, um, relies on spontaneity, but also shapes strategically uh, the course of, uh, of events, and which is transparent and, and democratic. Uh, on the question of the internet, at the end of the day, it's a means of communication, and they're important and it's important to analyze how they interact with revolutionary processes, but they aren't um, uh, fundamental drivers in, in, the, in their own right. In the English Revolution, for instance, the printing press wasn't new. The printing press has been around for 150 years. But 
Because of the breakdown of censorship, the ability to produce unlicensed um, press was huge. You know, pamphlet and leaflet production uh, exploded, increased exponentially, and the revolutionaries were able to make use of that. Now, that didn't cause the revolution, but it did in certain ways manage to educate, inform, and organise the, rev the revolutionaries. But, Sass and Sass's point is, is, is true, at any level of development and with any means of communication, from the pamphlet to the internet, that will take place in a revolutionary environment because suddenly the masses have access to and a purpose for that means of communication, which they didn't previously, previously have. The other thing I would say about it, its, its operation in normal circumstances is new things don't just stand on their own, separate from everything else. You know, this always irritates me about period dramas. If you watch period dramas on TV, um, all the interior, all the furniture will be exactly 1930s. And all the vehicles will be exactly 1930s vehicles. You know, they spend a lot of time doing this. But you actually look us around, look at pictures of the 1930s. Of course, they've got vehicles on the road. They've still got horse-drawn vehicles. They've still got cars from 20 years before. The furniture in your house and my house isn't just, you know, 2000s furniture. You've got bits of old furniture from all over the place. Now, you think about how the internet works. Actually, what it works by is very often, and some of the most powerful pieces, are print journalism, which are taken and shared across, uh, across the internet. Certainly, the existing mainstream television networks work very hard to make sure that those little bits of clips of film, Channel 4's bits of clips of film, RT's clips of film... So you're not watching a wholly new process, you're watching an amalgam uh, process, and to work it properly, you have to understand the amalgam. You know, it's, it's different when Owen Jones takes the Guardian column and puts it on the internet to when you or I just put whatever our random thoughts that day happened, happened to be. And that's, I think, an interesting thing to, to, to think about. Um, on, on the existence of the state, I think um, it's best to assume it's going to react nastily. In most cases, it does. If we get lucky and it doesn't, that will be good. But it's not sensible to assume that that will be the norm, because the norm is something, uh, is something else. From El Sisi in, uh, in Egypt through to, um, uh, to um, the Charles I state in 17th century England, the state reacts with violence to challenges to its power most of the time. And it's best to assume that that's going to be the case and to organise accordingly. If you organise effectively accordingly, of course, that's the thing that would actually minimise the ability of the state to react in, uh, in, in, in those ways. And just to bring it right back to the, to, the, to the beginning, it is precisely the emergence of new forms of institutional power within a revolution which eats away at the capacity of the old state um, to be effective in the deployment of, uh, of, of violence. Uh, in some ways, it obliged it to do that. The, the, the power of the Puritan cause in the Long Parliament forced, and the popular mobilisation, forced Charles I to raise his standard at Nottingham, raise an army, and try and resolve it by armed conflict. The strength of the new model army um, prevented him from being victorious. Oh, okay, over there, and then one in the front, and then over there, and here. <laughs> no, nope, uh, the mic's coming around. Okay, thanks, um, uh, John and Sathis, for your, uh, your remarks. I'd just like to, I hope you don't mind, um, give a bit of reflection on uh, some of the forms of organising that we, uh, I don't witness if that's the right word, when we were over in Tunisia, I... Um, accidentally ended up ended up in Tunis the night before the second wave of revolution broke out in the Casper um, and there was 
quite a lot going on. Initially, I was invited over um, from the, by the Islam channel to go back with Muhammad Ali, who had been exiled for 19 years um, and wanted a delegation to go back with him. I was one of them as the University of London president, having been the stu student union president here at SOAS, along with John and a few other people. And there's a number of things that we observed while we were there. First of all, the night we arrived, um, there was a meeting being held by trade unionists, and we thought there was going to be about 30 or 40 people there. There was about 1,000 women there. There was about 100 men as well, which was great. Um, but the women were demanding political representation on the committee because the new committee that had just been elected had... Um, I think little or no um, women on, the, on that committee um, and there was also no student or youth um, representation on it either. So the very next day as we were just pottering around, we all of a sudden noticed small groups of people with various banners with different um, wording, which I don't speak much <coughs> Arabic on it, but uh, they were sort of from lo local neighbourhoods um, and, and various other campaigns and so on, all making their way to the Casper. And before we knew it, it was absolutely packed with thousands and thousands of people in the Casper. We heard that day that there were um, 55 coaches of students that hadn't been able to make it because they'd been blocked by the committee um, or the government at the time. So there would have been even more people there had they been able, able to get through. The student and youth were um, there um, demanding you know, youth representation on those committees as well. So I think it's important to recognise the role of women in these um, um, campaigns and obviously the role of um, students um, in their student unions and so on. Later on that afternoon, the um, news from Libya came through <coughs> that Libya had also just uh, toppled the government uh, or the revolution just started and the crowd went absolutely wild but they didn't just celebrate for Tunisia and for Libya but they were chanting freedom for Palestine and I think that's the important point there to, to recognize is that you know revolutions don't just happen for one or two, you know one reason but because people have uh, you know a history of organizing on lots of different topics anti-war topics economic topics um, liberation topics and so on and I think they all came neatly together and just finally Finally, the point um, about the army's role in that um, in that day, because one of the signs of a revolution is really which side did the army go um, uh, during a revolution. And on this day, the army definitely took the side of the people. The government had sent the army in, obviously, to try to stop the occupation of the Casper. But the the um, big army tanks were only just literally pretending to push back the protesters and the protesters were pushing back the army trucks and so that's <laughs> quite clear that the army had taken their side. The one person that we spoke to in the square that day did on the topic of the internet, my final point, um, she did say look there's a huge thing over there that says Facebook and some people are claiming that this is a Facebook revolution but she says you've got to remember that even if Facebook exists it's humans that have the agency, it's humans that are making those moves <coughs> on the internet and it's through those local neighborhood committees that I spoke about and the student unions and so on that they might use the internet as a tool but they still have often already existing forms of organization so I thought I'd give you those points too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks and over here. Thank you very much for your talk and thank you very much for the contribution because I think when we talk about Tunisia, it is uh, a bit impossible to ignore women's role in the revolution or re rebellion, whatever we call it. And I have two questions, one for Statis, am I pronouncing right? And one for John. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, the Tunisian state distributes various forms of benefits which are essential for social control. And therefore we had the very authoritarian centralized Tunisian state totally controlling the means of economic mechanisms, therefore they become very political. Uh, when we see the regional dynamics in Syria and in Egypt as well, those authoritarian states uh, provide some sort of, sometimes a little bit strong welf welfare uh, provisions, <coughs> and uh, like including Turkey where I'm from. Like universities are free and they support, in, they, in Turkey for the last 10 years, this RKP regime is really providing lots of welfare uh, benefits to the people. And you have also mentioned that there is a demand for state intervention from people. So when I compare the uh, United Kingdom citizens with Turkish citizens and their demands and expectations from sta state, in Turkey, and especially in Syria, with Syrian refugees, their demands from the state uh, sometimes shift to the territory, which is quite anti-capitalist state. So normally, like in Britain, state takes from the poor, give it to the rich. 
But in those countries, states are very much challenged by the public. Although they are authoritarian, there is a strong challenge and resistance. I wonder what you think about it. And also, I was wondering why those states are providing lots of welfare benefits. Is it why we have that type of states in those regions? Is it uh, inter imperialist intervention? But also, there is a demand from the public, which is shaping uh, the state character in a particular form, maybe less, less democratic, but more welfare state. Sorry, this was my first question. Second Thanks. question to John. Uh, Succinct, I was, if you can. Yes, yeah. sorry. I was wondering, this is more clear, I wrote it. I was wondering if we are taking the risk of confusing the difference between reform and revolution by using the concept of revolution in referring to the contemporary rebellions, protests, uh, and other revolts uh, in our times. Thank you. Thank you. And just over here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for this presentation. It was very nice. Um, well, I have two questions. I will be very fast, uh, as fast as I can. Um, first, um, don't you think that the idea of a social security today and the NHS, um, I don't know a lot about the NHS, but for example, in France, in the case of France, the social security was um, a very uh, good thing that happened. But since its uh, institution as a universal sec social security, years after years, it was more and more put into questions until today where it's very shrinking. Um, and I would like to know if today's social movements are not too much about protecting this compromise that we made with capital and not asking for more. And more will be new institutions. And maybe uh, the left today should be more concentrated on finding new ways of organizing uh, finding new institutions rather than defending institutions that we already lost. Um, and my second uh, question uh, would be to react about the Soviets um, in the Russia. Uh, I think that maybe I, I'm wrong, and or oh, that's my lecture of history, but the Soviets were dismantled not by uh, people themselves, but they were dismantled by the, um, by the communist state. Like Le Lenin said, all the power to the Soviets and all the land to the peasants, but two years after this statement, the Soviets were dismantled and the land was collectivized and all the power went to the state. So isn't, in this case, the state a real problem uh, in to achieve uh, communism? Yeah. Thanks. And we had one in the front here. essentially a simple question, at least I think it might be, about um, the language and the reasons and the rationales and the aims and the test of success of left revolutions to be approached perhaps essentially by way of the rhetoric of left revolutions. And it seems to me that you might divide the kinds of rhetoric up into six, of which the first is freedom or liberty, effectively a political aim to be realized. And the second is a life to live, a life to live for the poorest he, essentially material. And the third, very familiar to everyone, is liberty, equality, fraternity. <coughs> And the fourth, fairness or justice, which comes in many variants. And the fifth, one you haven't heard of, but you will in the future, which I happen to propose, is humanity. But last of all, and the one my question is really about, the aim or justification or rationale or essential rhetoric of the Tunisian revolution which was, of course, dignity. And I'm curious as to how dignity stands to those others. This isn't any condescension on my part. It's real interest and curiosity. Thanks. Um, I should have taken the woman back there first. She left now. Um, is there any one last question? Okay. 
Um. Uh, right. Okay. I'll be. I'll be. Can do. Do I need a mic or? Uh, there is I, I have one. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, I'll be. I'll, I'll be much quicker than than before. Um, as far as I understand, because once again, I'm not a specialist, um, the Tunisian state, like the other states that came out of decolonization, right, to put it briefly, uh, they came out with all the, you know, the limitations and the fact that, you know, they, they were capitalist states, obviously, etc. but they, they were the result of a process of struggle, of popular struggle. Uh, popular masses have been active in the process leading to independence and liberation from colonial rule and therefore concessions needed to be made, right? The material and, and, and moral and political concessions needed to be made. So there was a social contract after the independence and particularly during the Bourguiba uh, period which included indeed extensive measures of welfare but also very active role of the state in the economy itself, right? Uh, Bourguiba and his party were supposedly socialist, okay, but by socialist in Tunisia, like in most of the other <clears throat> post-colonial uh, situations, what they meant was, you know, a strong and interventionist in all kinds of ways state. Now, there are elements in that, uh, and th this was put into question, of course, I mean, many of these uh, uh, parts of the social contract were put into question with the ne neoliberal turn of the 80s and, and later. Now, the difference, I think, between uh, the welfare state as, as, you know, still exists, although, you know, shrinking in, in Europe and there, is that there was this whole part of m mechanisms distributing resources to the population that were to a very large extent informal, right? That, that did not operate in, on the basis of, you know, rights and titles which were, you know, openly and publicly somehow uh, assumed and, and, and therefore, you know, act in, in a purely institutional framework. Huh? It operated through much more micro-informal arrangements and this means that, you know, there was this small scale regime of clientelism, favors, uh, uh, giving this to this one, another to this group, to this individual, to this family, etc., in order to keep, of course, uh, social peace and control of the population. This doesn't mean that there, there are not important parts of the, you know, of, of the state and of the uh, public agencies that do not operate according to the principles of, you know, the universal rights of the welfare state. Obviously, education, for instance, is crucial here, right? I mean, uh, Tunisia has a very successful, in its way, system of uh, public education. A lot of people gained access to that, uh, which, of course, is great. And then, you know, they hold degrees and they can't get a job. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this means that, you know, the, 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 this generates this kind of distorted by clientelism and small-scale corruption uh, welfare state uh, generates all forms of conflict and forms of intense politicization of the economic mechanism and of the mechanism of distribution of resources because it constantly generates frustration, resentments, feeling of injustice, feelings that, you know, you have been uh, somehow uh, discriminated, that, you know, all this is very opaque, that it doesn't follow the rule. So it, there is a very strong uh, demand for, you know, fairness, right, and, and, and moral standards, actually, not only at the top, but also at, you know, the bottom of uh, the social mechanism. Uh, the social movements about defending, uh, etc. I mean, uh, look, we have to discuss concretely and what, what do you mean by creating new, new things? I mean, we, uh, I'm, I'm very open to the idea of creating new things, but I would like to know a bit more about what is exactly new in this. I, I can't really imagine any political proposal vaguely progressive that dispense itself from defending universal free access to healthcare and education. This is simply unthinkable for me. Uh, I don't care at all if this is considered as passé or, you know, archaic and, and, and so on. But I think that, you know, there are absolutely crucial battles 
to defend not everything perhaps in social security, but certainly to defend you know, the idea of a universal access to free health care. And one of the battles that have already started actually, but uh, still for, you mentioned France, is maintaining you know, free <coughs> access to education, well, which is currently now very rapidly uh, changing and, and will change even more if we do not uh, react so. By the way, it's since I lived in France most of my life, the only thing I'm a bit proud of in generational terms is the 1986 battle we gave uh, 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 against the first attempt actually to institute tuition fees uh, in, in France. As you know, a demonstrator died, um, uh, killed, was killed by, by the police, but we won actually. And this is what became the whole thing almost sacred uh, for several decades. But you know, now it comes back um, uh, in, in, the, in, in the discussion and, and we'll have to, to, to fight again. Um, Soviets and, and, and state, um, uh, right, uh, look, I mean, we can't have, I think, this, uh, you know, the discussion on, you know, what happened exactly. I think, nevertheless, that for me, uh, this view will probably very, be very unpopular in, in, in the room. But for me, uh, it was an illusion of Lenin to think that, you know, the Soviet as such could provide the full structure of the state and to minimize uh, the, th the necessity of institutions uh, also in communism. So uh, these institutions are, do not necessarily take the form of the state, if by state we mean, you know, kind of very bureaucratized mechanism that uh, reduces population to passivity, prevents participation, etc. But uh, for, I can't imagine any uh, complex and properly organized human society without, uh, without institutions, without forms of power that go uh, with it. Uh, but they need to be thought differently, of course, than you know, the, the kind of uh, exclusionary uh, and very bureaucratized mechanisms that, uh, that, that exist today. The idea that you can dispense yourself from that and abolish it in all cases when it has been tried uh, the, the Soviets are one attempt, the Cultural Revolution in China are the second, produced exactly the opposite uh, result, simply because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's unworkable. Uh, and, and I think a very important lesson needs to, be, uh, needs to be drawn from that. It's awfully rightist, I know, it's awfully reformist, or uh, etc. As, as, as a position, it's not glorious at all, but I think that, you know, um, if we want to, to win and not, you know, repeat somehow the, the same mantra, a certain number of things have to be uh, changed in, in our way of thinking. Thanks. Um, on the question of um, reform and revolution, when we're talking about the, uh, the Arab revolutions, um, I, I think obviously in certainly in the Marxist tradition, it's, it's traditional to distinguish between uh, socio-economic revolutions, which are a transformation from one mode of production, feudalism to capitalism, capitalism to socialism, and democratic revolutions, which change the nature of the, the government from an autocracy, a monarchy, to some kind of parliamentary democracy. Now, um, traditionally, um, it's uh, been argued that one can open the path to another, that demands which start as demands for democracy can challenge economic inequality and private ownership of property. And I think that's true, but not all revolutions obviously do that. Does that mean to say they aren't um, worth supporting? No, of course not. Anybody who's remotely tried to, or knows people who's tried to work in an autocratic uh, or dictatorial regime as opposed to a parliamentary democracy knows the difference. And so those revolutions might not achieve all that they could potentially achieve or all that we might want them to achieve or transform the society from a capitalist society to a socialist society. Are they worth doing? Are they worth supporting? Is there the potential within them? Yes, yes, and yes, I would uh, uh, answer those, uh, those questions. I think the critical thing about the uh, uh, decline and disappearance of Soviet democracy was that any form of democracy, any form of workers' democracy, can't exist without an empowered, conscious, and organized working class. And that working class, small in Russia to begin with, have been destroyed by the civil war. And that um, left, as Lenin said, left the state suspended in the air. And once the, the real participatory um, 
working class activity that had informed that state had been eradicated by the disappearance of that class. You've got to remember, by the end of the Civil War, there was grass growing through the cobblestones in St. Petersburg's industrial districts because they were uninhabited. The class that had informed that democracy had ceased to exist as a political actor. And so, of course, a bureaucracy would arise and, and overthrow it. That was a, a virtual inevitability by, by the mid-1920s uh, mid um, without um, the revolution spreading abroad. Um, on how to shape demands, I think the most important thing about thinking what demands the left um, should fight over and can fight over most effectively isn't the question about what we're thinking. To be honest, any idiot with a ballpoint pen and a pad can sit down and think up a thousand ways in which the society would be better than it is. That's not the issue. And if the model is going to be, oh, I've thought this, all I need to do is to tell you about it, and millions of working class people can say, that's it. That's what was missing. Got the idea, right, I'm ready to go for it. Not how it works. What's going on in this society right now is this. I was brought up in the 60s, and my parents um, had lived through the 20s and the 30s. And they thought that I would have a better life than they'd had. They thought that I, and this was true, I was the first person in my family to be born in an NHS hospital. I was the first person in my family to come home to a publicly owned council house. I was the first person in my family uh, to go to university with a, full, uh, with a full grant and with the bursaries paid for by the state. And my parents assumed that we were the first lucky generation. What they didn't get is we were the only lucky generation and no parent now bringing up a working class child thinks that their life is going to be easier than the life of the previous generation. Now that's a huge thing. It's a massive thing to take that away from working class people. So when they start defending, especially when the society has reached the point of a, a tipping point crisis with health provision, with Grenfell and public housing, with Carillion, this is now a moment where that sensibility that things ought to be at least like they were for our parents, that's a crisis moment for this society. And the job of the left is to articulate and mobilise people uh, around that. You know, people think that um, working class people are powerless because they believe I bad ideas given to them by the press and the ruling class. Actually, they believe those ideas because they're powerless. And once they begin to move into action, once they begin to feel less powerless, they begin to shake off some of those ideas as well. And I think that's a, a, a moment that is now uh, standing before us. I don't say that it's a, a revolutionary moment, but I do think, I think Jeremy Corbyn was right about, about Carillion. I think it's a watershed moment. I think it's a, a, a social transformation which could get aborted, could be held halfway, but which is opening up a possibility of quite considerable change now.